how to resolve conflict. If anybody's got any tips, I'd really like to hear them. <laughs> conflict. Of course, the, the classic Buddhist way of resolving conflict is avoidance, isn't it? I'm going to go and sit down and cross my eyes and cross my, oh, oops, cross my legs and close my eyes. And there, it's all going to go away. Go into another world. The conflict disappears. Strangely enough, by some curious mechanism of fate, when you open your eyes and come out into the world again, there's the conflict. <laughs> What's going on? Could it be? Could it be that meditation alone isn't going to solve all of our problems? <gasps> oh my God, is that a heresy? No, hang on, it was the Eightfold Path, isn't it? Right view, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. Only some bits of it, of the Eightfold Path, are meditation. Very good to bear that in mind. Yeah? Only some bits are meditation. Other bits is not meditation. So if you think that you can solve all your problems by meditation, then you have left the path of the Dhamma. You've strayed into the wilderness and the thicket of wrong views. <laughs> kind of interesting, this idea of views, isn't it? We, in, the, in, the, in the Metta Sutta we just chanted, uh, uh, <clears throat> One of the changes, I'm not sure if you know the changes, but the specific, one of the specific changes in the Metta Sutta in the original translation, it said, by not holding on to views. Okay? Something like that. No, 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 by holding on to fixed views, I think. Fixed views, yeah, fixed views. And then in, in, in it's changed to not holding on to false views. All right? Now, that's only a, a small shift. Fixed to false. Both of them start with an F, right? <laughs> so there's some common ground there. But in between those two words is a whole history of ideological conflict. Okay? <laughs> and uh, unresolved, may I say. Perhaps unresolvable. Right? And uh, so... It is interesting how, how, how these things can be seen in different ways. And uh, for those of you who, who are not aware of the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, battle lines, so to speak, uh, is that uh, one of the main teachings of Ajahn Sumedho in particular is he basically teaches not to have any views. This is probably just a simplification of him, so don't... Don't quote me on this, right? You have to listen to what he says about it. But, but anyway, a simplification of it is that you, you don't have views, right? It's wrong to have views per se, okay? And, uh, and that's, that's a, a, dare I say, that's a view which <laughs> uh, one can hear quite often in different circles of Buddhism. And uh, uh, it's quite possibly was influenced by, uh, originally by D.T. Suzuki, and uh, that was one of the main uh, books in English. When Ajahn Sumedho was a young monk in Thailand, they had very few teachings available in English. In the, he started there in the 1960s. They had very little. And uh, D.T. Suzuki's writings on Zen mind, beginner's mind, and so on, these were some of the very few books that were available. And so that kind of influences this idea of not having views. And then Ajahn Brahm, on the other hand, uh, is the he, he's the Dipti Warden, he's the teacher of the doctrine of view. He says you should have views, right? But you should have right views. Okay? And so this is why it's changed the wording from don't have fixed views, which sort of suggests not having any kind of view or something like that, to 
not having false views. Right? Okay, now the Pali actually says Dhyatincha Anupagamma. Okay, Dhyati is a view, right, which is just a theory or an, uh, 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 an opinion. Anupagamma means not, uh, literally, not having approached, not having gone near. Upa means close, gamma means gone, okay? So not having gone near to views, okie dokie. Now that particular phrase in Pali is an idiom which is found much more commonly in um, uh, other contexts. It's the same idiom that's found in the Dhamma Chakra Pavattana Sutta. Okay, ubho ante anupagamma. These having not gone near to these two extremes. Okay, now in the in the Dhamma Chakra Pavattana Sutta, the Buddha's first sermon, those two extremes are the extremes of sensual indulgence and uh, self mortification. So that they're extremes of practice. Okay, but in many other places, and particularly in the Nidana Sangutta, they're extremes of theory. Okay, and so for example, you have two extremes of theory. One is um, Everything exists, sabangati, right? And the other view is nothing exists, sabangnati, right? Does that make sense? Everything exists. What does it mean to say everything exists? Seeing things are what they seem, or they just are per se. Yeah. But you, we can, even though the, the precise uh, philosophical explanation of that might be quite subtle, but still we can recognize that there's two kind of different attitudes embodied there. One is like this kind of positive attitude that wants to affirm the existence and the reality and the truth of the thing, and the other is this kind of nihilistic attitude that wants to get rid of everything. Yeah? So there's two kind of attitudes. But anyway, these two extremes, the Buddha said, Anupagamma, same word, not going near these two extremes. Then there's various other. Uh, formulations that are used in a similar way. So it's, it's a recognized and quite a standard idiom in Pali. And so the phrase Dittincha Anupagamma in the Metta Sutta uh, means uh, uh, either, you know, if you were to translate it literally, directly from the words itself in the Pali, it says not going near views. Okay? Right. Now if you want to interpret it so it can be you could you could interpret it that way, and so then you could you could from that you could infer that say Arjun Samedo's interpretation or that that kind of school of interpretation has some justification because the the sutra itself the literal interpretation just says not ha not having views not having having anything to do with views. Uh, on the other hand, if you interpret it in terms of how the same idioms are used elsewhere in the suttas, then you could say well what it's actually talking about is not having false views. Okay, not having extreme views. Okay, and cultivating right view. Okay, so both of those interpretations are, are possible. Okay, and uh, so this is this is a different kind of approach. In some respects, I think that that these things uh, are, are to some degree a matter of uh, simple personality. I think we we relate to things. Different people just tend to relate to things in different ways and have different priorities. So to some extent, I think these kinds of differences of perspective are probably um, irreducible or unresolvable. But nevertheless, there's quite a, that's quite a difference in the path, isn't it? Yeah? If you say you shouldn't have any views at all, to the saying, well, you should have right view. Now, of course, the, the Noble Eightfold Path starts out with right view. Yeah? So, and it says get rid of wrong view and have develop right view. That's what it says. That's the Noble Eightfold Path. And that's, that's the foundation of everything. If you're not able to do that, then you haven't even started. If your view's wrong, then your intention's wrong, your speech is wrong, your action's wrong, your livelihood's wrong, your effort's wrong, your mindfulness wrong, your, your samadhi is wrong. And that's what it says in the suttas. It's pretty depressing, isn't it? Now, all this effort, you can go and make all this effort in meditation... And if you got start out with wrong view, everything is a waste of time. It's all wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. <laughs> so, uh, of course, things are, you know, 
things are often not quite so black and white as that. And uh, typically, actually, we have what we actually have. We talk about like right view and wrong view. What we actually have, if we look in our minds, really, what we actually have is confusion. Right? This is the actual content of our mind most of the time. So right view, wrong view. Well, actually, we're struggling to be able to articulate a particular view or a coherent picture of the world. And often we have different aspects of our mind believing in quite different kinds of things. Yeah? And, and our views are very often not examined and they're not resolved. We can put different compartments in our mind. Uh, and you know, we, can, we can be a, you know, a, a hardcore scientist who believes in evidence and all of these kinds of things, but we still read the astrology page in the paper in the morning. Yeah? Uh, and all of these kinds of things. And, 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 and that's what human life is, and it's always like that. And it's very interesting looking at, at uh, you know, the history of people's uh, attempts to understand human culture and, and within Buddhism. Uh, uh, for example, when people are talking about the history of Buddhism, they, they, they often tend to sort of reify these differences. So you have these, you have these like kind of intellectual scholarly Dhamma, which is practiced by the monks, and then you have a devotional cult of a, of a deified Buddha, which is practiced by lay people, and they sort of make this distinction. As you said, it's one group of intellectuals and the other group of d- devotees, and they're doing completely different kinds of things. Whereas actually, if you look in Buddhist culture, you see, well, actually, the same monastery that might have you know, studies in Abhidhamma may also have uh, doing devotional pujas and building a stupa and having relics in them and so on and so forth. Yeah? And there are actually different strands of things going on in, this, in, in the mind. Yeah? There are actually different things going on in the mind. And so we imagine and we project a conflict in the world as if these are two unresolvable forces, whereas in fact they're just things people do. And maybe, that maybe we don't have to make a problem out of it. I'm not sure. But I certainly think that uh, you know, if, we, if we're looking, if we want to clarify our view, then... Uh, one of the things that happens when we do that, and you know, you have this kind of very beautiful phrase: "The unexamined life is not worth living." Okay, well, I think that's that's probably a bit, bit extreme. You know, it's like we've got an ostrich near our, near our monastery. A real ostrich. And, and, it, and, it, and it was very interesting for me because we were driving past this back and forth, back and forth every week. And in the back of my mind, I had this kind of perception there's an emu in that paddock. And we were driving past and there's this, there's this emu there. But I knew that there was something wrong. And I couldn't quite work it out until I know. <laughs> no, actually, it's not an emu, it's an ostrich. Right? <laughs> And uh, so that we, had, we, we, saw, we saw him today and he was very beautiful and, and standing there and so on. And, and his life is not examined, right? So I imagine, right? I imagine that ostriches do not reflect on the nature of their existence, right? He's not sitting there thinking, how do I get back to Africa, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that, no, but I can have a pretty good guess, I think. So he's not reflecting on his life, but you know that's a very much an intellectual imposition, isn't it? We say the unexamined life is not worth living, therefore, well, we might as well lop the ostrich's head off, it's not worth living. <laughs> right? Well, what's he doing when he's taken? Yeah, well, that's a myth, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that... The, head, the ostrich's head in the sand is actually a projection of the human condition. Yeah, that's the unexamined life. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that is the unexamined life. Yeah. So that is. I mean, it is a pretty brilliant metaphor for the human life, isn't it? But the um, poor old ostrich. Life is an example. So we, 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 there's a sense in which, you know, for us as, as humans, that, that examining our life is um, very important. It is very central, and it's very central to what, 
to our, our kind of sense of us of like a higher humanity, right? Of something that we can use in a spiritual sense to 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 raise ourselves up. Right? One of the things that happens when we do that is that when we reflect, when we're able to reflect on our views and to examine them and subject them to evidence, then we tend to get a bit more flexible with them. Yeah? Uh, and so this is why you, know, you have such awful things like fundamentalism, for example. I mean, fundamentalism, of course, is this, this kind of refusal to reflect uh, and to use evidence and so on on your views. And, and, and you know, seeing the world in very black and white terms. And this is very kind of, um, it's very adolescent kind of behavior, pre-adolescent really. It's like, it's like, you know, the kind of thing you'd expect from a 10 or 11 year old is just to see that the, the world in this black and white terms. But as we grow older, we realize, well, actually there are different ways of seeing things. Okay, so this is one of the things of maturity is to understand different people have different minds, they're different than ours, and it's not the case that our minds and our thoughts are always right and they're always wrong. Okay, and it's not the case that wisdom always resides in us and foolishness always resides in everybody else. And also to understand that um, it's okay to be wrong. Yeah? And it's and you don't have to be threatened by uh, kind of examining your views. And I was having this discussion with a monk who's a friend of mine when I was in Thailand earlier this year. And because, of course, one of the things that I like to do is to kind of refute Theravadan fundamentalists by showing them that, that not everything included in the Pali Canon is absolutely, literally 100% exactly what the Buddha said, and that there might even be some things outside of the Pali Canon which also contain some things the Buddha might have said, which is a shocking and revolutionary idea in certain circles. And uh, I was speaking to a, a, a monk who's a friend of mine, a very intelligent and uh, thoughtful monk, and you're saying that when he kind of looks at these things, you know, and if you kind of compare the, the Pali and the Chinese and stuff, he says you can feel this, this kind of, this kind of, almost like this, this threat or this kind of creature behind you. Just you don't know when it's going to grab you on the neck, and and, and he can he actually feel this fear, you know, of the fear of your ideas or your ideologies being destroyed or being broken. Yeah, but as you get more and more, uh, the more you question these things, if you question them intelligently and, and constructively, then they have a certain, they develop a certain resilience, okay? Now this is different from questioning it in a destructive manner, okay? And this is some, sometimes what people can do and in intellectual circles and so on and in, in, uh, in, in the um, Buddha's day it was described as wandering around refuting the doctrines of others and, and uh, uh, what is it, the... Uh, uh, like uh, uh, using like using the weapon of the tongue, like the sword, using the sword of the tongue to to uh, refute the doctrines of others and so on and so forth. So you can use logic and reason and so on in a destructive manner. And if you do that too much, then of course you get what you know we're familiar with in the kind of the modern condition and uh, uh, nihilism and cynicism and and all of these kinds of things. And that comes from too much of that, okay? So there, obviously there needs to be a balance. There needs to be some ability to deconstruct, but that needs to go hand in hand with a constructive and a positive approach uh, so that the deconstruction has a context and it can be uh, absorbed and contained. So, uh, so for example, you know, just to give a practical example how we relate to that in the monastery, say, say we, you know, we do, uh, say, comparative and textual studies. We take apart the Pali suttas and look at them, compare with them with different versions and things like this. And so this is a deconstructive approach. But we also uh, chant the suttas in Pali every week and, 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 chant, and chant them very beautifully. Well, I think they chant them very beautifully, sometimes more beautiful than others, and try to bring that, that devotional sense to it. Yeah? So it's not just saying, you know, we can sit down and through a 
through a you know an analytical and intellectual approach we can then understand the sutta no that's one aspect but we also bring that devotional thing when you chant something especially you chant it in a group you you embody the teachings in a way yeah? you you actually bring them into your heart and so we we do that combination of things and i think that's very important and interestingly enough i just got a message from my my friend Venerable Analio a couple of weeks ago, and he, because he's also doing a lot of comparative study and analytical work on the suttas, and uh, he he wrote to me and said, "Oh, do you know anywhere I can get some good chanting tapes?" Because he said he felt the same need. He said he wanted to 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 listen to the chanting of the Pali as well as as well as doing the analytical work. Yeah, and so that's that's uh, uh, I think very important to bear that in mind. Now, if you have both of those sides of things, then you get a certain resilience, a certain flexibility, and that means that there's much more openness, okay? And that means that you can be much more, you can have a lot more confidence, okay? And that means you have the space to uh, hold and allow for and accept differences and diversities, and this is one of the great sources of conflict, okay? Basically is the idea that, 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 that somebody else should be as I want them to be, right? And if they're not like me or they're not like my projection, then there's something wrong with them. And, uh, and so there's this kind of expectation and so a lot of conflict comes when we, when our, our projections on people, our expectations of them, doesn't meet with the reality of what that person might be. Now that can happen in, in positive ways, in negative ways, in all kinds of ways. But we always have to remember that uh, what we see, if, we, if I walk into the room, what we see in that room is not people, right? You don't walk into the room and see people. You walk into the room and see light. You see color. That's what you see. Yeah. You don't hear somebody talking. You hear sound. The idea of those other persons is actually a concept in your mind. Right? It's a. Co I have a concept. Right? This person, that person, so on, so on, so on. And that concept tells me how to put together the sense data that I'm receiving. Okay? It tells me how to put together my sight, sound, smell, taste, and touches. And I interpret them in a certain way. Okay? And you project that on your idea of that person. And that doesn't correspond to the reality. And one, one simple example of this is the time when there was one of the, the Thai ladies who used to come to the monastery in, in Bodhinyana all the time. And she used to come and very, very devoted and would always bring dana once a week and and uh, uh, very uh, helpful and so on. And uh, she came to the monastery one week and uh, and you know she was quite well known. All the monks knew her very well and so on. And she came and uh, one of the monks uh, said to her, "Oh, oh, you're, you're, not, you're not looking well today. What are you? Do you if you're feeling ill or something like that?" And uh, and she responded, "I didn't put my makeup on." <laughs> 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 it's like, oh, oh, oops. Yeah. <laughs> so there's this kind of this kind of projection in the mind. What's that person? Oh, they're ill or something like that. No, no, it's not actually that person's inner condition. The inner condition's quite fine, really. So. This is why one of the, the most important uh, aspects of any uh, relationship and, 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 and um, accepting that is, is listening, okay? And, and like a, a complete listening, not just listening to the words someone's saying, but listening with your whole body, listening to, to that whole person's whole thing, how they are. And just trying to be with that and understand that not being in too much of a hurry. I, it's kind of, I, 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 uh, it's one thing I find quite startling, really, how, 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 how many people uh, seem to be able to know 
straight away where a person's at and pass judgment on that person. This person's like that, that person's like that, but the person's the other, yeah? And pass judgment so, so quickly and to, to believe in intuition. And this is something which is, I think, quite damaging. Yeah? Intuition is not sure knowledge. Okay? Intuition is just a function of the mind, that's all. It's a natural function of the mind. Sometimes it's right, sometimes it's wrong. Yeah? And uh, one of the problems is, you see, we've basically got two ways of, of, of developing knowledge or developing understanding. Okay? One of them is the active way, and that means doing stuff, right? So if you want to learn about something, you find the information, you get the data, you assemble the evidence, you examine that, you interpret it, you analyze it. Okay? And then the other way, and that way is fairly easy to teach. It's easy to convey what to do, right? Uh, for example, if you need to know, well, how, what kind of ceiling do we need to put in this place? Well, you find out the different kinds of ceiling materials, you find out what their price is, you find out how to install them, etc., etc. It's quite easy to do that kind, get that kind of knowledge and explain that and communicate that. Intuition is not easy to communicate, and it's very mysterious. It's n and it's the very nature of it is like underneath the surface. Okay? If it's not from underneath the surface, it's not really intuition. And intuition is just something that arises spontaneously. And because it arises spontaneously, we think, we imagine that somehow it doesn't come from anywhere. We imagine, we, we tend, this is why there's this tendency to attach to it and to reify it and to think that somehow it's real truth. Okay? And of course, often it is. Yeah? And, and, and often it does tell us things which are deeply wise and need to be listened to. But it's not the infallible voice of God. Right? It's just a part of us. And intuition is something. Intuition it needs to be informed by evidence or by by information, okay? And information then needs to be informed by intuition. They need to work together. Right? That means to say, when we're listening to somebody, we listen to them, and at that time, we're just open to that, and we're just we're just accepting, accepting what we can learn, and we're not being in a hurry to pass judgment. And then, and then allowing that time to then reflect on it, discuss it if there's a problem, and uh, to uh, give that problem time to find its own solution. Okay, not being in a, too much of a hurry to push it. And uh, this is something that. Um, I think all of us know, and certainly in meditation we know, we've got one of these science magazines at the monastery now, and that we just, there was an article in that basically saying there's new evidence to prove that, that if you basically think about a problem too much, you, you're less able to solve it. And there's a certain degree where you should think about something and analyze it, and then there's a certain degree where you just got to relax, have a cup of coffee, yeah? do some meditation, and then the, the answer to the problem will come to you. So that needs to take its own time. You can't push it. You can't force it. And so sometimes when there's conflict, like in a community or between people, then you have to uh, give <coughs> the due consideration and due respect for, for these different aspects and for these different processes. So there needs to be a listening, there needs to be a talking, there needs to be a time to reflect on those things, a time to discuss them, and so on, and there needs to be time to ignore it and just let it be. Yeah? And at the end of that whole kind of process, then hopefully there'll be a resolution coming. Yeah? But it's not something which you can force. Part of that, I mean, when I started the talk tonight, I said, I said, you know, meditation isn't going to solve all your problems. right? And it's really, really important that we, we acknowledge this and, and, and pay attention to it because I think this is a major problem for, for a lot of Buddhists is that we basically try to avoid problems. And I'm, I, I speak from personal experience here. Right? <laughs> many, many times I've tried this. They try to avoid solving problems by thinking I'm going to go away and meditate and then it's going to get better and it doesn't. Yeah? And so you have to realize, that at the end, after, after trying this for many, many times, at the end you realize, hang on, something else is going on. And what's going on is that the mind has different aspects, like different dimensions of the mind. Okay? And 
trying to solve one kind of thing by using another kind of solution is just not going to work. Okay, they're different. They're like totally different ballparks, you know. And uh, you know, it's like it's like as you've got a blocked toilet, you know. And you say, well, how are we going to solve the blocked toilet? Well, we'll just meditate and we'll, we'll hope it goes away, you know. <laughs> well, no. <laughs> you don't let it, you, you get the plunger, you go and unblock the toilet. That's how you unblock a toilet. Yeah. So if there's a problem, now, now, now that, that, that inner work, that individual work, obviously is part of that. So that's your problem, right? Doing meditation primarily and, and, and paradigmatically is solving your own inner problems, okay? So that's what you do meditation for. You don't meditate in order to solve problems in a community. Of course, it's not completely separate, right? It's not, of course, if you do your meditation, you're able to develop metta in your meditation, you're more relaxed and all of these things. Of course, that will help you to solve the problems in the community, yeah? We take that for granted, it's obvious. But that by itself is not going to do, is not going to do it. Similarly, solving problems in the community, yeah, will tend to help your individual meditation. But not absolutely, not 100%. You can solve the problems in the community, yeah, be very nice to people and go all that, and, but, but still have rubbish meditation. Yeah? So these things are not, there's no one-to-one -one relationship between them. They have a flexible interrelationship and they, they can work in lots of different ways. So what that tells us is that we need to clearly identify is that where, where is this problem happening? Is this simply a matter, is this conflict simply a matter that I've been feeling irritated and annoyed and aggressive in my meditation. I haven't been able to meditate and I feel frustrated with that and so I snap at people and get angry with them. Yeah? Is that the source of the conflict? If that's the source of the conflict, fine. Just go away, do your meditation, solve it and everything will be all right. But very often that's not. That's, that, what, what you find on a practical level, if that comes and goes, then it's usually okay. You don't have to worry about it any more than that. You know, it might be just one day, you're not feeling so good, blah, 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 a bit of change a few words or a bit of unpleasantness or something, then a couple of days later it washes over, it's not a problem. So those kinds of things don't make a big deal of. But then there are other things which are much more intractable. And those things that are intractable usually come because we're projecting some kind of image on, onto another person. Okay, So we, we're, we're uh, 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 expecting them to be some way which they're not. And uh, when that happens, then we systematically interpret everything they do as being bad or wrong. Okay, you know, like where they put their shoes, it's in the wrong place, or how they, how many spoons of sugar they have in their tea, it's wrong. You know, or whatever it may be. So we systematically twist everything around. Now it's at that stage that we really need to start investigating and breaking these things down. We need to, we need to, 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 to try to be, look objectively at the issues, look objectively at how we're thinking about things, how we're structuring our thought. And one of the great tools that we can use, which, is, which you can see, see in your mind, is that when that's happening, when that process of objectification is happening, listen to the, the, the monologue that's going on inside your mind at that time. Okay? And what the monologue will be is something like, he did this, he did that, he did the other. She did this, she did that, she did the other. Yeah? And so there's this, there's this objectification, this externalization, this, this third person thing in the mind. So that's, that's like, it's like an other, which is over there, which is not you. Yeah? And, but, but actually, they're not there, right? <laughs> they, they don't ex they're not, this is just you in your own mind, right? This is you talking to other, one bit of your mind talking to another bit of your own mind, right? And it's using the third person as if one person's over here and the other person's over there. Right? So what one really powerful tool to use at that stage is very simple. When you're talking to yourself in your mind, instead of saying he, she, use we. Okay? Just say, I'm just going to change my pronouns. Right? I'm just going to change my pronouns. And if we've been studying Pali, we can we know how to do it with Mayang. Okay, we can change the so to Mayang. And we. 
And that makes a huge difference. Instead of you saying, you know, you're trying to think, well, well, you know, she did that kind of thing, blah, 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 blah. You're thinking, we, and what are you going to say to that? How is that sentence going to finish? We, 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 we need to fix this, you know, we need to resolve. We, we, we have obviously been misunderstanding each other. We uh, should be friends, really. Yeah? And so as soon as you bring the we into it, yeah, then there's a togetherness. Yeah? And so that can be a very, very powerful uh, tool for undercutting those kinds of projections. So this is just a little talk for this evening on uh, resolving conflict and different kinds of aspects of that. So I hope that's been of some entertainment value for you all.